How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here again. This time we're going to take a look at hybrid orbitals. So our objectives will be to describe what happens during hybridization and determine the hybridization present in various molecules. So let's start by talking about the valence bond theory and its shortcomings. So the geometries of atomic orbitals and the shapes that molecules make when bonding isn't consistent. So if we take a look at like nitrogen, nitrogen has three unpaired P electrons and they all have 90 degrees of separation between them, right? So I have the three P orbitals here, uh, and you can see that between them, there's 90 degrees of separation. So if it was just uh, orbital overlap, you would expect the bond angles to be 90 degrees in NH3, but they're not, right? So there are atoms that make more bonds than they have unpaired electrons as well. So taking a look at NH3 has three unpaired electrons, uh, 90 degrees away from each other. But when you look at NH3, they don't have 90 degrees separation. There's also atoms that are like, hey, for example, sulfur makes six bonds in SF6, but it only has two unpaired electrons. So how is it able to make all of these bonds if there's only two electrons that need to be paired up? How is it able to do that? So that's where hybrid orbital theory will come into play. So in order to account for the bonding and the geometry, we need a new model of the atom. We need to understand it in a different way. So hybrid orbital theory basically states that atomic orbitals of an atom mix and form new orbitals that we call hybrid orbitals. So hybridization is this process of mixing and as a result, changing the atomic orbitals as they approach each other to form bonds, right? These atoms aren't atoms anymore once they're in a molecule. Uh, so talking about how the electrons behave around the atom doesn't really work so much. We gotta start talking about, well, how are they behaving on the molecule? So the total number of atomic orbitals isn't changing, right? So if I take two atomic orbitals and I mix them together, I'm gonna end up with two hybrid orbitals. I don't end up with just like one magic orbital. If I put two atomic orbitals in, two hybrid orbitals come out. If I put three atomic orbitals in, I get three hybrid orbitals, right? So when we are trying to describe the hybridization of these orbitals, we describe them by what went into creating them. So if I took an S orbital and a single P orbital and I hybridized them, I would make two SP hybrid orbitals, right? The SP is telling me I made, used one S and I used one P to make these hybrid orbitals. If I took a single S orbital and I took two P orbitals and hybridized all three of them together, I would make three SP2 hybrid orbitals, right? If I had SP3 hybridization, that's because I took one S orbital and I took three P orbitals and I mixed them together to make four SP3 hybrid orbitals. SP3D, again, a single S, three P orbitals, and a D orbital went into making those hybrid orbitals. And then SP3D2, again, I took one S, I took three P orbitals, I took two D orbitals, and I mixed them all together to make hybrid orbitals. So paired electrons can also be unpaired by being promoted to another orbital and end up unpaired in hybrid orbitals. Basically, it's just saying that even if you have these paired electrons and you're hybridizing them, they might not stay paired. All right, so notes organizer that might help you is it could look like this. You have hybridization in one column, number of hybrid orbitals, and then electronic geometry. Uh, so yeah, feel free to use that in your notes or something. So let's take a look at SP hybridization. So I take an S orbital and a P orbital, and I'm gonna make two hybrid orbitals that we would describe as SP hybridized, All right? So I'm taking that S1, I'm taking that P1, I'm mixing them together, and I'm making two SP hybridized orbitals. Now the shape of the orbital is similar but different to the S and also similar but different to the P orbitals. So if we take a look, we know that the S orbital is like this sphere and the P orbitals are kind of this peanut shaped. Well, the two P orbitals that we didn't touch, we call unhybridized, right? They, they didn't change at all. We didn't mess with them. They're unhybridized. They're as they were. But when we mix the S and the P together, we get hybridized orbitals that look similar but different to both of them, right? So we still have these two lobes going on. One though is significantly larger than the other one. And this helps them overlap better with other uh, orbitals, right? So it takes on a linear geometry. And when we only look at the larger lobes, it kind of looks exactly like this, maybe like a bow tie kind of with the, the nuclei in the middle. Um, so yeah.
So let's talk about SP2 hybridization. So again, we take an S, we take a P, we take another P, we mix them together, and we get three SP2 hybridized orbitals. All right, so I'm taking the S, two Ps, and I get SP2 hybridized orbitals. Again, their shape of the hybrid orbitals still looks like a mixture of S and P. It hasn't changed much from the SP hybridized. Uh, and the geometry around the central atom with this hybridization would be trigonal planar, or 120 degrees between each. Right, Because when I put those hybrid orbitals around the central atom, they're going to repel each other and try to get as far away as possible from each other. And it's going to take on this trigonal planar shape. So SP3 hybridization, we take an S and we take the three Ps, we mix them together, and we make four SP3 hybrid orbitals that all look the same. All right, So we have four domains around that central atom now, and that's going to take on the tetrahedral shape. Right, so methane kind of has this going on. So I have this hybrid orbital right here reaching out and overlapping with this hydrogen, and that's what's happening there. Uh, and it's happening everywhere else. Those hybrid orbitals are now reaching out and overlapping with the other hydrogen orbitals, and we end up with a tetrahedral shape when we look at it. All right, special note so unshared pairs of electrons also need a hybrid orbital. So an example is like an H2O, right? The expectation based on unhybridized orbitals would be, well, all right, we have these unshared P electrons right here. Couldn't they just overlap? Couldn't we just have a hydrogen overlapping here and then a hydrogen overlapping here? And then our bond angles would be 90 degrees from each other. But that's not what we see, not at all. So if it was that simple, uh, you know, all the bond angles would be 90 degrees, but the actual bond angles reflect a tetrahedral electronic geometry. If you take a look at the bond angles for H2O, they're closer to 109.5 than they are 90 degrees. So how is that possible? Well, let's see. If I draw the Lewis structure for H2O, I see that I'm going to need four domains. So I need four hybrid orbitals, right? I, those unshared electrons also need a hybrid orbital. So the only way I'm going to get four hybrid orbitals is with sp3 hybridization. So when I hybridize those orbitals together, I still end up with two pairs of electrons being all paired up and two unpaired electrons that are looking to make bonds. And that would explain the geometry that we observe. So I, I see these two hydrogen atoms overlapping with the sp3 hybridized orbitals. And then the other two that aren't bonding are where those unshared pairs of electrons are. So let's take a look at sp3d hybridization. So again, a single s with three p's and a d orbital hybridized together, and we make five hybrid orbitals that we call sp3d hybridized. This is going to form a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. If I got five orbitals, if I have five domains, I'm going to end up with a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. So I'm hoping you can see it here. You can see there's like a triangle along the equator and then there's a north and south pole. And that's how we end up with two triangle or triangular pyramids. So trigonal bipyramidal. And SP3D2, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the pattern yet, but that would be one S, three Ps and two D orbitals hybridizing to give me six SP3D2 hybrid orbitals. Right, and there's a little trick. If you want to know how many hybrid orbitals there are, well, S, there's a one plus three Ps plus two Ds gives me six hybrid orbitals. Now the geometry for this hybridization would be octahedral. Right, so how am I going to get six orbitals around the nucleus That's knowing that they're repelling each other? Well, you're going to end up with an octahedron. You're going to have like this square equator with a north and south pole giving you eight faces. So it'd be octahedral. So how do we how do we determine what the hybridization is? You've talked all about what it is. How do we determine what hybridization we got? Well, the first step is going to be to draw the Lewis structure for that molecule. So example, NH3, right? I drew it there. Second is to determine the electron domain geometry using the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. So I go, all right, well, if I have one, two, three, four domains, well, that's going to tell me that it's going to be tetrahedral for the electron domain. All right, I got to look at the bonded atoms and the unshared pairs of electrons, add them all together. 
and I need one hybrid orbital for each of those domains. So if I need four domains, well, what hybridization is that going to need to be? SP3, because that'll give me four domains. So pause it, try a little practice, predict the hybridization and electron geometry for each of the following. All right, welcome back. All right, BEF2, if I recall correctly, it's going to look like this. Let's see, there's 14 plus 2 is 16. Yeah, and then the fluorines all have an octet. Well, all right, well, how many domains do I need around the, the beryllium? Well, I need two domains, which tells me that it's going to have to be SP hybridized, which tells me that it will be linear. All right, BF3. And draw out that Lewis structure, boron in the middle, and I can't think of two different letters and write. So let's see, boron there. All right, I've placed all the electrons. I need three domains, so it's going to have to be sp2 hybridized, which tells me my geometry is going to be trigonal planar. All right, n2. All right, well, n2 has this triple bond and an unshared pair of electrons. So it needs one, two domains. It needs two hybrid orbitals. So it's going to be SP hybridized. And it's going to be linear. All right, CH4. Again, I, I, I draw my Lewis structure. I need four domains. So I need four hybrid orbitals, which tells me it's going to have to be SP3 hybridized which means its shape would be tetrahedral. SF4, let's see, SF4, 6 plus 28 is 34, is 32. So then, boom, unshared pair of electrons on the sulfur. I figured out the Lewis structure. Now I need one, two, three, four, five hybrid orbitals because I have five domains. So let's see, S. P would give me, SP3 would give me four, I need one more. So SP3D, which tells me the electronic domain would be trigonal, bipyramidal. And then SF6, well, let's see, S1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all those are fluorines. And that would complete my octet for the fluorines. So six domains. Six hybrid orbitals would have to be sp3d2, and the shape would be octahedral. So yeah, summarize. Can you describe what happens during hybridization and determine the hybridization present on various molecules? I hope so. Goodbye. Okay,